Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Well, in the last lecture on the Enlightenment, we talked about the Enlightenment political theory of the natural law. And uh, different Enlightenment thinkers did different things with this theory. For instance, the Englishman John Locke thought that all governments should respect the natural law and that they should respect people's natural rights to life, liberty, and property. And therefore, it was necessary for every government to be based on the consent of the governed, to not take away their life, liberty, or property without the people's consent. Jean-Jacques Rousseau also believed that government should be based on the people's consent at its origin. However, uh, he believed that once government was created, the will of the people had to be completely supreme, the general will and that nobody had any rights that the general will could not take away. There was a third approach, though, that became very prevalent through much of Europe during the Enlightenment period, and that was the idea of the absolute rule of um, a king. Now, often, uh, the idea behind this was that the king would actually be more enlightened and more progressive and that he would help to liberate his subjects from uh, old-fashioned ways of thinking and, and, and from oppression coming down from earlier times. Um, we saw that Thomas Hobbes, for instance, the English political thinker, um, wanted to set up a government where a ruler would have absolute power so as to establish um, complete peace and harmony within the society. So this lecture is going to focus on um, the growing trend during this period in Europe towards having absolute monarchs um, who often were believed to uh, exemplify enlightenment ideals. One place where this occurred was in Russia. Now a little bit about the origins of uh, Russia. Um, the people that we call Russian today are actually descended from the Vikings uh, from the northern parts of Europe. They were a very dynamic and expansive people and um, as they were sailing to places like America and taking over different parts of Europe they also invaded um, Russia and um, established their headquarters at a place called Moscow and uh, at first, as you can see here from the map, Moscow was a tiny little realm in red, but the Muscovites got a big boost when they allied themselves to uh, the Mongol Empire. This was um, the greatest, largest land empire in human history, and it started in Mongolia, northwest of China when Genghis Khan began to consolidate his power in the, uh, the late 12th, early 13th century, gradually expanded to include uh, pretty much all of Asia. Now, the Dukes of Moscow, um, this region of Muscovy, united themselves to the Mongols and uh, became their allies and served as their tax collectors as part of the Mongol Empire. And in return, the Mongols rewarded them with control over um, an ever-expanding part of Russia. And so you see on the map um, how the regions under the control of the Dukes of uh, Muscovy expanded over uh, the centuries. The Russians were Christian. Um, they Actually, there's, a, there's an interesting story about how they became Christian. Supposedly, um, the early Vikings, uh, who were known as the Rus in Russia, uh, considered different religions that they could join, like Judaism or Islam, uh, but they rejected Islam because they realized it wouldn't allow them to drink beer, and so they decided to join the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church, so they became Eastern Orthodox um, Christians, and in time they became the great defenders of uh, the Orthodox religion throughout Europe. In 1462, um, a ruler came to the throne of Moscow who's, who was known as Ivan III, and uh, Ivan took the title Tsar, uh, 
which means emperor. It's related to the Latin word Caesar. Um, so it's a, a, a title for an emperor going back all the, all the way to the time of Augustus Caesar um, in the first century uh, BC. So under Ivan, uh, Russia becomes an absolutist power ruled by a Tsar or emperor. Uh, the most famous and uh, in some ways the most hated emperor uh, or Tsar of this earlier period was Ivan IV who came to the throne in uh, 1547. Um, now, Ivan IV was responsible for the beginning of the institution of serfdom in Russia, uh, where people were forced to labor uh, on the farms of lords and uh, essentially lost their freedom. A serf is not exactly a slave because a serf cannot be sold However, uh, the serfs were bound to stay in the place where they were born and to serve the lord um, of that place who controlled them, and, the, and they were not allowed to leave, and they had to provide him with labor uh, whenever he wanted it. So it was really just one step up um, from slavery. Um, in 1564, Ivan IV did something very clever. Um, he was known for being a brutal and a ruthless ruler already, and his nobles were starting to rebel against him and against his very harsh rule. And so Ivan um, decided to give them what they wanted, and he quit. He abdicated the throne uh, and uh, went away from Moscow. What happened, though, was that the different nobles started to fight each other and uh, the kingdom descended into complete chaos in a very short time. So pretty soon, um, some of the leaders came to Ivan uh, in his retirement and said, we want you back. We need you to reestablish control. And uh, Ivan said, I will only come back on condition that you give me complete, absolute power, that you never question uh, my power ever again. And the situation was so desperate that they actually agreed to that. And so this was how Ivan IV uh, obtained for himself complete absolutist rule over all of Russia. And he used it in, in a very cruel way. In fact, he became known as Ivan the Terrible um, because of the terrible things he did uh, to anyone who dared to question his authority. But you see here a theme that's going to uh, continue throughout this lecture that Often, uh, people choose to live under an absolutist ruler. Why? It seems terrible to us. Why would you want to live under a ruler like Ivan the Terrible? Well, uh, in times of chaos and, and civil war and complete confusion, it's, it's very hard to survive. And um, if periods like that go on long enough, people are willing to give up some of their liberty in exchange for order and peace. And uh, that was what Ivan promised uh, to the Russians through his uh, iron-fisted absolute rule. Another attempt um, to establish an absolutist kingdom took place in faraway England. Um, this attempt was not nearly so successful, however, but uh, the Stuart family uh, tried to make themselves the absolute rulers of England beginning in the early 1600s. How did this come about? Well, we have to go back to the uh, 16th century. Um, the ruler of the Northern Kingdom on the island of Great Britain, Scotland, which was still independent at that point, in the mid-1500s was a lady named uh, Mary Queen of Scots. And there's actually a TV show on right now on the CW network called uh, Rain. Uh, that says I'm speaking this in 2016, which is about the early life of Mary Queen of Scots. When she was a young woman, uh, she married the Crown Prince of France, went to live at the French court, and uh, eventually became the Queen of France. But uh, her husband died, and she had to go back to Scotland where she um, remarried in a, a nobleman named Stuart and uh, they had a son uh, whose name was uh, James but her husband died in very mysterious circumstances and then uh, 
uh, Mary Queen of Scots very quickly remarried another man, which led people to suspect her of having murdered um, her husband. And so the uh, nobility of that kingdom, the aristocrats, forced Mary to abdicate her throne in 1567, um, which meant that her one-year-old son, James, became the king of um, Scotland. Now, most of the nobility by this time in Scotland were Calvinist Protestants, and they wanted to make Scotland a, um, a, a Protestant nation. And so the Reformation happened in Scotland when uh, the king, James, was still a little boy, and these Protestant nobles basically controlled him um, and forced him to institute the Reformation in Scotland. What happened to Mary? Well, she ran away um, to England, and she asked her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I of England, to take her in and protect her. Elizabeth didn't really know what to do because um, she didn't want the responsibility of putting to death an anointed queen uh, like herself. On the other hand, Mary Queen of Scots was actually her nearest relative, and she had a very good claim uh, to the English throne, and Elizabeth knew there were a lot of Catholics in England who would love to have a Catholic like Mary uh, replace her on the throne of England. So what she decided to do was uh, essentially to put Mary Queen of Scots under house arrest for um, 20 years and then finally um, on somewhat trumped up charges that Mary was plotting a rebellion with the English Catholics um, Elizabeth had Mary um, beheaded. However um, Elizabeth never married and she never had any children of her own so her nearest relative after the execution of Mary was um, her cousin James the sixth King of Scotland, the boy King of Scotland, um, who, uh, after growing up and becoming a man, and after Elizabeth died in 1603, uh, inherited the throne of England and became King James the first of England. Now, James never forgot <laughs> the miserable childhood he had had in Scotland, being overruled and controlled by um, the Protestant nobility there. He was a Protestant, but when he became the King of England, he decided that uh, he was going to reassert his power. He would never again let anyone control him again, and he was going to rule as an absolute king. And so James developed the theory of the divine right of kings, that is, the kings get their power directly from God, and that they are only responsible to God for how they use that power, and that no one can question or contradict them um, in any way, that uh, all the people have to obey the king absolutely. But this theory, <laughs> in a way, did not sit well with the people of England, who had a, a very long history, after all, of representative government. They had a legislature called the Parliament, which at least some of the people got um, to vote for. And so this was really an uphill battle by James um, and his successors in the Stuart family to um, establish absolute rule in England. One episode uh, that was very significant had to do with politics uh, on the continent of uh, Europe. In Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic in 1618, the king uh, Ferdinand was a Catholic, and uh, however, there were a lot of Protestants in Bohemia, and they accused the king of trying to oppress them and prevent them from exercising their Protestant um, religion. <clears throat> so King Ferdinand uh, sent three Catholic representatives to the city of Prague to talk to the Protestant leaders, and they were um, having a discussion on a, in a, in a third-story room um, when the Protestant leaders became incensed, and they took the three Catholic uh, representatives and threw them out the window. Uh, and this is what we call the defenestration of Prague. Uh, defenestration just means throwing someone out of a, of a window. Now, miraculously, um, the three Catholic uh, ambassadors survived, 
Um, and later the Catholics claimed that they survived because angels appeared to catch them and carry them, carry them down to the ground unharmed. The Protestants, however, um, told a different story. They said they had survived before because they, fall, they fell onto a giant pile of horse manure um, out in the street. So whichever version you believe, the defenestration of Prague was the incident that touched off the Thirty Years' War in Europe from 1618 to 1648. A hugely destructive conflict in which hundreds of thousands of people were killed, millions um, lost their homes. Um, all of it over um, religious issues, the fighting between Catholics um, and Protestants. Now, in England, there was a powerful party of people within the Church of England who were called uh, Puritans. And they were called that because they wanted to purify the Church of England uh, as they saw it and get rid of all the Catholic elements that still remained in the Protestant Church of England. So they were very radical Protestants. They wanted to complete the Reformation in England and to have a really extreme Protestant church there. And so, of course, the Puritans in England uh, wanted King James to get involved in the war the Thirty Years' War on the Protestant side. And uh, he actually had an incentive to do this because um, King Ferdinand had become the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, James's son-in-law, whose name was Frederick, um, was the Protestant rival uh, for the title of uh, emperor. And so if the Protestants could win the war, the Protestant Frederick um, would become emperor, and that would really be a feather in the cap of James um, and his whole family. Um, so uh, eventually James did agree to support Frederick and the Protestant side in the Thirty Years' War, but um, basically England's military interventions in this war were a complete disaster, uh, partly because um, James put in command of the English army his male lover, who you see uh, depicted here, George Villiers, um, who James uh, made a duke, the Duke of Buckingham. Yes, students, there really is nothing new uh, under the sun. Now, of course, uh, homosexual relationships were illegal uh, in England at the time, and you could actually be executed for them, but James was the king, and uh, he could do whatever he wanted, so even though he had a wife and, and, and a large number of children, uh, James was infatuated with uh, George and uh, put him in command of the army. But George Villiers, although he was a good-looking and charming guy, um, had no military talent or expertise whatsoever. So under his leadership, um, the English lost uh, a number of battles on the continent and spent a great deal of money um, in a hopeless cause. James died in 1625, and his son Charles, um, King Charles I, became the ruler of England. Now, the Puritans in the British Parliament, I, can, I should say the English Parliament at this point, um, continued to pressure Charles to stay involved in the war, to continue fighting on the Protestant side. However, uh, the problem was they really didn't want the tax increases that were necessary in order for England to build up its military. That's an old story, isn't it? We want the government to do things for us, but we don't want to pay taxes <laughs> for those activities. So um, for this reason, Charles increasingly was at odds um, with um, his parliament, and uh, the parliament uh, was fighting with the king. This was expressed in 1628 when the parliament drew up a document called the Petition of Right, in which they complained um, against King Charles for taxing them unlawfully. Uh, Charles's response was to dismiss the Parliament and uh, to not allow them to meet for the next 11 years. And so uh, from 1629 to 1640, Charles I ruled over England as an absolute um, king. So. Uh, in a way, this was the high point of uh, Stuart absolutism. 
Um, also, King Charles really didn't like the Puritans, and um, he took steps to diminish their influence within the Church of England. Um, and so the Puritans, being very discontented, um, migrated large numbers of them to America, where they set up the uh, colonies of New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and, um, and so on. But there were quite a few Puritans who remained in England. They continued to resist Charles's policies. And so finally in 1642, a civil war erupted between Charles and the Puritan-dominated parliament. This civil war dragged on for seven years and the ultimate result was that um, Parliament captured Charles, they put him in prison, and then they put him on trial for treason in 1649, found him guilty, and chopped off his head. Um, now, this was really kind of a, a cataclysmic event in Europe. Nobody could believe that the Parliament had actually dared to put their own king um, to death. It was something that very rarely happened. Uh, Happened. So, for a time, the Stuarts' family's um, desire to become absolute kings seemed to have failed completely. Let's go back to the Thirty Years' War, which was still raging in Europe. In 1629, the war took a very new and unexpected turn when the King of Sweden, Gustavus Adolphus, came into the war on the side of France. Now, France was a Catholic nation, and they were fighting in support of the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor. But Sweden was a Protestant country. Why on earth <clears throat> would a Protestant country support the Catholic side um, in the Thirty Years' War? Well, um, basically, um, the French Catholics had become very uh, disturbed by the rise to power of the Habsburg family um, in Austria. And so the French Catholics' main goal in the war after the first few years was to uh, prevent the Austrian Habsburgs from taking over um, Europe. And so uh, Sweden also uh, shared this goal, and so the Protestant Swedish came into the war on the side of um, the Catholic uh, Bourbon family who were ruling over France. And so for anyone who was paying attention, it was perfectly obvious that the war at this point was not about religion at all. It was really about power. It was about a power struggle and who was going to have uh, the most power uh, in Europe. And so people began to question whether this war really needed to occur. And in 1648, in a city called Westphalia, um, representatives got together and signed a treaty to finally end um, the Thirty Years' War. And basically what the treaty said was that it would continue the policy of the Peace of Augsburg, Cuius Regio Eos Religio, that is, that the ruler of any nation got to decide what religion his subjects would be, but um, this time Calvinists were included in that. So um, Calvinist rulers could make their nations Calvinist as well. It really wasn't much of an achievement after all the destruction and bloodshed that had been going on uh, for the last uh, 30 years, and people throughout Europe began um, to be discontented with these constant wars over religion, they asked themselves, was this really worth it? And so for the first time, um, you start to see people saying, well, maybe people of different religions should just get along. Maybe they shouldn't fight each other to the death, but they should tolerate each other and accept each other as they are. And so for the very first time after the Thirty Years' War, you start to get the beginnings of religious tolerance in Europe. Um, it was a long, slow process. As we'll see, there were some setbacks. But uh, increasingly, people began to question the idea of wars of religion and to promote tolerance. And often, um, this desire to avoid war went hand in hand with the acceptance of absolute um, rulers. <clears throat> 
in France, um, in 1643, the new king of France was a young man named Louis, um, who was the 14th of that name to rule over France. So we call him Louis the 14th. Now, Louis XIV, if you did the Roman numeral training at the beginning of the course, not to be confused with Louis the 16th, XVI, who we'll talk about later. Um, it was Louis the 14th who really became the first completely absolute um, ruler of France. And um, he saw himself as almost like the sun shining benevolently on his people of France. He saw himself as the center of life in France. So his people called him the Sun King. Uh, one of his most famous sayings, um, at one point Louis remarked, L'état c'est moi, which in English means, the state, it's me. <laughs> in other words, I am the government, I'm it. Uh, it's all about me. Um, and that was Louis's attitude as an absolute ruler. He built um, his idea of absolutism on the ideas of a French thinker from an earlier period, the 16th century, named uh, Jean Baudin. Um, Jean Baudin uh, was involved in the French wars of religion in the 16th century. And like many people, he was disgusted um, with the constant fighting over religion. And so he formulated a theory saying that only an absolute total ruler can restore peace and prevent um, religious groups from tearing each other apart and um, destroying uh, the country. And so Louis agreed with that. And uh, under the influence of Baudin, the French kings refused to allow the French parliament to meet for many, many years. The French did have a parliament like um, the English did. It was called the Estates General. But um, for 175 years, from 1614 to 1789, this parliament was never allowed um, to meet. And so the kings of France essentially ruled um, the entire kingdom personally. When it did meet again in 1789, it would have very momentous results, as we shall see in the next lecture. One of the things that Louis did um, to consolidate uh, his power was not in the spirit of religious tolerance. You remember that King Henri IV had issued the Edict of Nantes, which said that pr Protestant Frenchmen had to be tolerated and allowed to practice their religion in certain areas. Well, um, Louis XIV decided to unify his realm in terms of religion. Um, and so he revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685, canceled it. And uh, from that point forward, Protestants in France uh, were once again um, persecuted and oppressed in um, a number of ways. Another way that Louis unified his realm uh, was by getting the nobility, the dukes and great lords, on his side. How did he do that? Well, uh, to obtain their favor, he excused them from having to pay uh, the tax on land called the taille, which was the main source of income for the government of France. And so the great lords who had the largest estates weren't paying any taxes on their land. Um, and the poor people, the smaller landowners, poor farmers and peasants, were being gouged and were pretty much paying all the expenses of the government. That was a pretty big gift he gave to the nobility. What did he expect from them in return? Well, he built a really fabulous palace near Paris at a place called Versailles, um, and he required the nobility to leave their country estates and to come to Versailles for a large part of the year um, and to attend upon him there. What was the point of this? Well, um, Louis uh, was a very theatrical guy and uh, he knew how to put on a good show. And so day after day he would throw fabulous balls and parties and uh, all the nobility that were there to witness his grandeur and his greatness and, greatness and his wealth and splendor. And um, they were very impressed with him um, and his absolute power. So by co-opting the no nobility, Louis was able to establish um, total control of France. But the fact that the nobility lost their connection with their home places and became mere um, 
hangers-on of the king at his court at Versailles, uh, meant that they became more and more separate from the common people, and that would have uh, major results um, in the French Revolution, as we'll see in the next lecture. Back to England. Well, the Civil War was a chaotic time, and uh, England was without a king for 11 years until 1660. But finally, once again, the people of England became tired of the chaos and confusion, and they invited the son of King Charles I back to England to become um, their king. So here we see once again that in order to restore order, people are willing to sacrifice liberty. And they're even willing to live under a king who sees himself as absolute. This is a temptation for all people, um, including people in the modern world. Um, what's more precious to us, our liberty or peace? It's an interesting question. Um, well, uh, Charles II wanted to be an absolute ruler. In fact, one of his early teachers was Thomas Hobbes, uh, who I mentioned in the last lecture. Hobbes's great book, Leviathan, was um, an attempt to form, make a blueprint for a revived absolutist government um, in England. However, <laughs> Charles II was an enlightened absolutist and uh, he embraced many modern ideas, including religious tolerance. Charles II wanted to establish, uh, establish religious tolerance within England and Scotland. He didn't want people to be persecuted or oppressed on the basis of religion. He even wanted to give Catholics religious tolerance. And that was something that the Puritans in Parliament simply um, would not accept. And so, uh, like his father, Charles II was often um, at odds with uh, his legislature, and that was even more true of Charles's brother, uh, King James II, who became king after him. Charles II had a large number of children, but they were all born out of wedlock to uh, his various mistresses, and so none of them could inherit the throne, which passed to his brother James upon his death in 1685. Now, the thing about King James II was that he was actually a Catholic. Um, and he didn't try to make the Church of England become Catholic again, but he wanted to extend religious tolerance to his fellow Catholics. And that was something that Parliament would never accept. And so in 1688, uh, Parliament overthrew King James II in what was called uh, the Glorious Revolution. And they replaced him with James's daughter, Mary, and her husband, um, King William. So that was the William and Mary became King and Queen of England in the Glorious Revolution, replacing the Catholic King James II. And under William and Mary, um, Parliament got them to agree to a document called uh, the Bill of Rights, which um, is not to be confused with our own Bill of Rights, but it became a very important example that inspired our founding fathers because what it said was that the king himself, or the queen herself, could not be the absolute ruler of England. The ruler was what this document called the king in parliament. And that meant that the king had to consult parliament on every important um, issue and could not do anything without parliament's consent. So this was a great victory for the ideas of John Locke, who was involved in the Glorious Revolution. The idea of a government based on the consent um, of the governed. And so um, the attempts by the Stuart family uh, to establish an absolutist government in England um, completely failed. And so what England ended up with was what we call a constitutional monarchy where there was still a king or queen, but where Parliament, the legislature elected by the people, had uh, all of the power. Let's go back to Russia, <clears throat> where the Tsars were able to maintain their absolute power under a new family called um, the Romanovs, who became rulers over Russia in uh, the early 1600s. Two of the greatest Romanovs were uh, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Peter the Great became the Tsar in the year 1689. Peter the Great <clears throat> had spent time in Western Europe. He was very much influenced 
by um, new ideas of the Enlightenment that were coming forth um, at the time in Europe, and he really wanted to modernize Russia. He saw Russia as very backward-looking and old-fashioned, and he wanted to change life in Russia to make it a little more up-to-date so that Russia could become a modern, enlightened superpower under his leadership. Uh, one of the things Peter did <laughs> to make Russia more modern, you see in the little cartoon here on the left, uh, Russian men typically wore very long beards, and, and Peter saw that as very old-fashioned. Um, and you see here he adopted um, the European fashion of the time of having no beard. Um, and so he forced Russian men to cut off their long beards, a policy that was very, uh, very unpopular. But um, not all of Peter's reforms were so trivial. Um, essentially, he set about Rush, uh, modernizing Russia's army and navy, making it an efficient military machine. And so under Peter the Great, Russia continued um, to expand, as it did under um, Catherine the Great, an incredibly powerful female ruler of the late 1700s, who was also an enlightened absolutist ruler over Russia. Also in the Holy Roman Empire, there was a turn towards enlightened absolutist rule. Um, under the rule of uh, the Holy Roman Empress Maria Theresa, uh, who ruled between 1740 and 1780, and her son Joseph II, who ruled with her from 1765 to 1780, and then in his own right for uh, 10 more years. They wanted to, um, they were Habsburgs, member of the Habsburg, members of the Habsburg family, and they wanted to establish their absolute control uh, over the Holy Roman Empire, um, which by this time had shrunk, so we can now call it the Austro-Hungarian Empire or Austria-Hungary. Under Maria Theresa and Joseph, for example, um, they tried to uh, rein in the power of the Catholic Church um, so that they, and not the Church, would be the most powerful institution in society. They also tried to help the serfs in their realm, um, and so they were enlightened. They were instituting progressive reforms. Um, however, this was difficult to do in the Austro-Hungarian Empire because it was made up of many different kingdoms, many different ethnic groups and different peoples, um, and so they got a lot of pushback from different parts of the empire, especially from nobles who didn't want to give up their power uh, over the serfs and from members of the Catholic Church um, who didn't want the church to diminish its power. Um, and so Maria Theresa and Joseph were not terribly successful in making themselves absolute rulers. One ruler who was very successful uh, lived in nor northern Germany in the region of Prussia. This was Frederick II of Prussia, known as um, Frederick the Great. Um, Immanuel Kant, in uh, your reading group three for this module, uh, talks a little bit about Frederick, and, and Kant really admired Frederick, who was um, an absolute ruler, but he was also a man of the Enlightenment. Uh, for instance, he allowed greater freedom of speech within um, his realm, something Kant appreciated. But also, he did establish absolute control, kind of like Louis XIV in France, by getting the nobility on his side. And he did that by giving them jobs as part of the military. Um, and so, uh, Frederick co-opted the nobility by giving them high titles within the military establishment. Um, and in so doing, he was able to achieve his other goal of building up the Prussian military so that it could become a superpower on the continent of Europe. And so under Frederick, uh, Prussia, originally a very small region, expanded um, to include all the areas you see here brown, bounded in um, red. And later, as we'll see, it was Prussia that would become the keystone for a united uh, Germany. <coughs> So we've talked about reasons why people in Europe actually wanted to have absolute kings, for, uh, partly in order to restore order after periods of chaos and war, 
Uh, another reason to have an enlightened absolutist ruler was that they were often very effective in making their nations powerful. And we see that um, when we look at the fate of the Polish nation. Now, during the late Middle Ages, Poland had been a very large um, and powerful country, but the kings of Poland were always very weak. Um, the real power in Poland lay with the nobles, the aristocrats, and basically they could veto anything that the king of Poland um, wanted to do. Uh, meanwhile, all around them, to their east in Russia, uh, to their west in Prussia, and to their southwest in Austria, enlightened absolutist rulers during the 1700s are increasing the powers of Russia, Prus Prussia, and Austria-Hungary. And so, um, eventually, what happened was that the Tsars of Russia, the Kings of Prussia, and the Emperors of Austria-Hungary decided that they would just move in and carve up Poland, which was ripe for the picking. Um, and so uh, they were able, over um, a series of years, to partition Poland, that is to carve it up into different parts, and uh, each empire got uh, different portions of Poland, which they incorporated into their own countries. And, Poland, being so weak in its monarchy and so disunited, uh, could put up very feeble resistance. And so you see here that um, having an enlightened absolutist ruler could be a real benefit um, in terms of increasing your nation's wealth, power, and prestige. And that was yet another reason why many Europeans accepted this type of ruler, even though it seems very strange and distasteful to us modern Americans.